Today, we honor a man who has been an inspiration to our citizens, a model to our youth. W.C. Fields is a unique figure among the many screen comedians during the golden age of Hollywood. Many humorous quotes are attributed to Fields, revealing both his sense of humor and his outlook on life. I'm free of all prejudice. I hate everyone equally. I certainly do not drink all the time. I have to sleep, you know. Hollywood is a gold camp on a rotten tooth. Women are like elephants to me. I like to look at them, but I wouldn't want to own one. How do you like children, Mr. Fields? Ah, boy. <laughs> Who's a great man? <laughs> about W.C. Fields abound, some of them true, some not true, and many perpetuated by the great man himself. W.C. Fields has a bucket of martinis that you pull down all day long. I have a bucket of martinis. No. Fields once said, you're not an alcoholic if you drink nothing stronger than gin before breakfast. There's another story. Once he was on his way to a bar, and a friend invited him to join him for dinner, and Fields said, uh, no thanks, I never eat on an empty stomach. <laughs> of course, the wild story about Fields drinking actually happened in the studio one day. Yes, yes, you see, Fields, Fields, Fields carried a cocktail shaker with him everywhere he went. He claimed it was full of pineapple juice. One day, some practical joker at the studio got hold of this cocktail shaker and put some real pineapple juice in it. When Fields took his first swallow, he hollered, Somebody's been putting pineapple juice in my pineapple juice. By no means a lovable figure like other comedians, he instead cultivated the persona of a misanthropic cynic. Far! Oh, I'd wait a minute, they're still on the green. Well, let them get out of the way. Yet he presented a character with whom many could identify as an everyman confronted with everyday troubles. The petty bungler, the henpecked husband, and the harassed father. And the frustrated sportsman. Oh, wait, you can't do that. What do you mean I can't do that? He was also the conniving con man and unscrupulous trickster who rarely escaped without getting his comeuppance. Philadelphia was the birthplace of William Claude Dukenfield, Bill or Woody to his friends. He was born on January 29, 1880, or perhaps on February 10, 1879, his birth date being only part of the haziness of his childhood. What is known is that he was the oldest of five children of a Cockney immigrant who supported his family selling vegetables from a cart. According to Bill, he had only four years of schooling before he was obliged to join his father at work. But young Bill preferred to spend time at the cart learning how to juggle rather than helping customers. He often practiced using fruits and vegetables as props, much to the annoyance of his father. After a particularly violent quarrel, during which his father beat him over the head with an iron shovel, 11-year-old Bill ran away from home. Homeless, he grew up on the mean streets of Philadelphia, sometimes sleeping in a hole dug in the ground. His famous bulbous nose resulted from brutal beatings he received at the hands of a gang of young hooligans. That was not the only feature from his rough youth he took into adulthood. His hard scrabble days on the streets and occasional nights in jail molded his cynical outlook on life. 
But according to the Dukenfield family, he lived with them until he was 18. Aside from a few independents seeking jaunts away from home during his rebellious teens and some petty crime, his youthful years were not that unusual. Bill had invented most of this troubled childhood to embellish his life story and perhaps bamboozle reporters for the fun of it. His grotesque nose was not the result of a brawl, but of genetics reddened by overindulgence in alcohol. Of course, the sad story is really that Fields actually started drinking when he was a hungry kid because it gave him access to the free lunch counter in the saloon. He claimed he could put away a pretty good meal with a five cent glass of beer if he ate fast enough. At an early age, Bill had the ambition to become the world's greatest juggler. He claimed that as a teenager, he had been hired to juggle at an Atlantic City amusement park. At the urging of management, he would occasionally jump into the ocean and pretend to be drowning to draw a crowd before starting his performance. But this may be more Fieldsian fabrication. He billed himself as the vagabond juggler or the tramp juggler, partly because, as he said, he had only one change of clothes. But he soon found success, becoming a vaudeville headliner under the stage name of W.C. Fields. He boasted he could juggle anything he could lift. Some of his juggling skills survive on film from his later movie career. Starting in 1901, he toured the world, eventually sharing the stage with such greats as Sarah Bernhardt, Marie Chevalier, Harry Houdini, and a young whippersnapper named Charlie Chaplin, whom Fields detested, calling him a goddamn ballet dancer. While in Europe, Fields juggled before royalty at a command performance at Buckingham Palace. In his early 20s, he was at the top of his profession with nowhere to go. Included in his act was his wife, former chorus girl Hattie Hughes, working as his assistant. While performing, Fields blamed her whenever something went amiss, a routine he reused later in his career. of their son Claude, Hattie quit both show business and the marriage. Fields remained on polite but strained terms with his estranged wife and son, continuing to support them throughout his life. But his devotion was to his show business career. Some have suggested the shrewish, nagging wives of his movies were inspired by his tense relationship with Hattie. Stimulated by the sound of laughter, Fields used an increasing amount of comedy in his juggling routines until finally they were comedy routines without any juggling. One comedian who became a major influence on Fields was Burt Williams, shown here in a 1916 film doing his poker in pantomime routine. Despite severe racism at the turn of the century, Williams sidestepped the color barrier and became the most popular and successful comedian of his time. In 1911, he joined the Ziegfeld Follies, the top star in an otherwise all-white cast. However, Williams was obligated by the theatrical conventions of the era to perform racially stereotyped characterizations while wearing blackface. Even at the top of his game, Williams struggled against prejudice for recognition and acceptance, overwork being one of the factors in his untimely death at the age of 46. W.C. Fields once said, Burt Williams was the funniest man I ever saw and the saddest man I ever knew. Fields, the master juggler and upcoming comic, 
was also signed by showman Florin Ziegfeld. He joined the Follies cast that included comic Ed Wynn, Eddie Cantor, Fanny Bryce, and Will Rogers, a rope trick specialist who, like Fields, had increasingly turned his act toward comedy. Fields' love of sports often provided the source of his comedy sketches. One of his routines involved a pool game, parts of which were employed in his first theatrical film, Pool Sharks, made in 1916. On stage, Fields' pool room routine was worked out with wires pulling the balls with a mirror hanging overhead for the audience to see the action. In the movie, stop-motion animation moved the balls around. One time, while performing the pool game sketch, he noticed the audience was laughing in all the wrong places. Rival comedian Ed Wynn had hidden himself under the pool table, making faces at the audience while Fields performed. Detecting Wynn's presence, Fields whacked him over the head with his pool cue, knocking the comedian senseless and getting the biggest laugh of the sketch. Wynn never again attempted to upstage Fields, and Fields never tolerated anyone else trying it either. Perhaps his famous hatred of children and animals stemmed from his vaudeville days. They were formidable scene stealers. Aside from a short film used as part of a stage performance in Ziegfeld's Follies, Pool Sharks marked W.C. Fields' earliest movie appearance. Most of the film revolved around the tired old plot of two rival suitors in pursuit of the same woman. But Fields managed to inject some of his own brand of humor into the movie. He made another film, Now Lost, but movies held little attraction for him. Instead, Fields returned to Broadway, appearing in both Ziegfeld's Follies and George White's Scandals. I wish you could be here with us tonight. Have your big name in Palm is here. There he is. There he is, Thorne Ziegfeld. Get a good look? He's with his wife, Billy Burke. Along with his pool act, Fields developed a golf lesson act in which the ball is never struck due to a thousand distractions. This routine was immortalized on film in While at the Follies, he made the acquaintance of a young dancer who shared his sense of humor, Louise Brooks. They would later co-star in a film together. Fields did not get along as well with his boss. More interested in presenting his beautiful showgirls, Flo Ziegfeld considered comedians such as Fields, Burt Williams, and Will Rogers necessary evils. I won't need it either. In the middle of W.C.'s golf routine, Ziegfeld had one of his star showgirls strut across the stage leading a Russian wolfhound. Enraged at being upstaged and the injection of irrelevant material into his routine, Fields ad-libbed a comment. That's a beautiful camel you have with you. 
Both Ziegfeld and the showgirl were outraged, but the joke got a big laugh and so stayed in the routine and even made it into the film version. In 1923, Fields starred in the Broadway musical comedy, Poppy. It proved a smash hit, and Fields repeated his role of Professor McGargle in the film version, retitled Sally of the Sawdust. In the movie, McGargle is a juggler and carnival huckster who takes under wing an orphaned girl. Fields would play father figures to sweet ingenues in later films. Some have speculated it was a way of having the family he was denied off screen. On the other hand, perhaps Fields was simply repeating a successful formula. His subsequent films revealed no love for the institution of family. Sally of the Sawdust gave ample opportunity for Fields to show off his carny skills. Cinema pioneer D.W. Griffith directed the film and also had Field star in his next movie, That Royal Girl. Now missing, That Royal Girl is on the American Film Institute's list of top 10 lost movies. Curiously, newsreel footage survives with the stars arriving at a theater showing That Royal Girl. Naturally, Fields hams it up. Fields made these films at Paramount Studios, where he would continue to make feature films during the remainder of the silent era. He had signed a contract with them guaranteeing him $4,000 a week to make three pictures a year for five years. Emma! Action! Buddy Rogers appeared in one such movie with him. Mr. Lasky said to me, Buddy, do you have argyle, knickers, and socks? I said, well, that's all I wore at the University of Canada. Uh -huh. He says, please wear them tomorrow. I said, fine. I wore them the next day. Uh -huh. 10 o'clock, the school door knocks. Uh -huh. They pulled me out, put me in a limousine. They took me way out on Long Island. And I saw when we got there, we're approaching a, a golf course. Mm -hmm. I could see cameras. I could see, I could see action and people. And they took me out of the car. And they took me over and said, uh, Buddy, here's your father, W.T. Fields. You're going to play his son in this, this, this movie. This wonderful movie. I have no idea. Yeah. What was it called? Called uh, Soldier Old Man. Rumors abound that Fields was difficult to work with, but his fellow actors remember him differently. He was a pixie. He was pixelated. He was cute. Uh -huh. He was charming. He was sweet. Some directors found Fields troublesome and egotistical. Other directors who let him do what he wanted got along with him very well. Bill always resented authority of any kind especially bossy directors and studio executives. He was very suspicious of banks, spreading out a fortune in many small accounts at hundreds of different banks during his vaudeville days. He eventually wrote a book, Fields for President, railing against such social institutions as family and government. Much of his resentment against society in general formed the basis of his comedy. While not achieving superstardom or even major stardom, Fields did well in silent movies, even if his films did not do so well at the box office. An excellent pantomime, he could convey a wide range of thought and emotions as demonstrated in this rare promotional footage. A firm believer in recycling, Fields continually reused comedy routines such as this checkers sketch. Comic bits he developed on stage were used in the silent films he made, only to be reused again and again in the new media of radio and talking. Also a great improviser, coming up with new lines and bits during filming, even at the risk of losing the take as the cast and crew broke up laughing. When talkies came in during the late 20s, many stars found their careers in jeopardy. W.C. Fields was not among them. Instead, his raspy nasal drawl perfectly matched his screen persona. 
His work on stage had prepared him for the demands of talkies. How do you do? He made his sound debut in The Golf Specialist, a short that recreated his stage routine during his days at the Ziegfeld Follies. Oh, no. And he was about to strike you? Well, perhaps he would have if you hadn't been here. Why, the big, great hulking brute. You know, I've never struck a woman in my life. You haven't? Not even my own mother. The character that defined Fields for audiences was already evident in this comedy short. Hello, little girl. How old are you? Five years old. Five years old. Will you give me a dollar to put in my bag? I'll give you a dollar to put in your bag if you'll sing me a song. Give me the dollar first. Ah, uh, you're more than five. Go and get out of here. Ah, uh, come on. Come on, fly. You're straight. Get away. In 1933, Fields made four more shorts, this time for producer Max Sennett, the widely acclaimed King of Comedy. Around this time, Fields abandoned the phony mustache he'd been sporting on stage and in his silent films. The Fatal Glass of Beer was a spoof of Victorian-era melodramas, with its hoary tale of an honest boy gone wrong because he took to drink. used the film to indulge in his penchant for bizarre sight gags. It also contained one of his most famous bits. And it ain't a pit night out, a man of peace. A deadpan spoof of creaky melodramas, it did not go over well with 1930s audiences who simply did not get the joke. His other shorts did better. The Barber Shop, The Pharmacist, and The Dentist, in which Fields pushed boundaries with risque humor. Two more on little dog bits. Dr. Kulitzer. He bit me right here. Dog bit you? Yes. Yeah, it was a little dash hound. Oh, yeah. A little tiny dog. And he sneaked right up behind me and bit me right like that. You're rather fortunate it wasn't a Newfoundland dog that bit you. Sit down. Shall I use gas? Well, gastroelectric light. I'd feel nervous to have you fool around me in the dark. <laughs> Will you say ah, please? Ah, a 
The most notorious routine of the film was the tooth pulling scene. Have you ever had this tooth pulled before? No. This won't hurt you much. This was a tamer version of the act Fields had performed in Earl Carroll's Vanities on Broadway in 1931, but still was considered quite risque for movies. When the motion picture code was enforced a couple years later, this scene would be cut from re-release prints. Only years later would it be restored to astonish audiences anew. Fields liked to test the bounds, always resenting the interference of both the censors and studio heads. Closer is cheap and the tawdry is out. There is no room on the screen at any time for pictures which offend against common decency. And these, the industry will not allow. With the success of the shorts, Fields found himself back at Paramount. Now the studio was grooming him for bigger things. One was a musical comedy extravaganza called International House. In part a spoof of Grand Hotel, which had just won the Oscar for Best Picture, it featured an all-star cast, even if only a few of them are remembered today. Fields played Professor Quayle, landing his peculiar aircraft in the mythical land of Wuhu, China, joining the rest of the cast for merriment and mayhem. Censors crack down on Hollywood. International House has lots of pre production code goings on. From a plethora of scantily clad showgirls to risque humor. Oh, Tommy. Yeah. See, we must have got our shorts tangled up. Fields felt quite at home with all the nonsense. What won't they think of next? The film proved a big hit, and Fields' star soared upward. International House has a curious footnote in Hollywood history. Filming was temporarily disrupted by the 1933 Long Beach earthquake. Wasn't there an earthquake once when, when W.C. Fields was shooting a scene? I think they have it on camera. And he uh, very blithely walked away. Everybody ran. But no cameras were actually rolling during the quake. So the whole thing was restaged by the studio for the benefit of Paramount's newsreel. It suited Fields' love of fakery. You probably saved my life. Now what can I do for you? Take us to Shanghai. A Shanghai? Yeah. It 
it's too bad he didn't get a chance to do some solid, serious, uh, dramatic roles, you know, rather than uh, solid, serious, comedic roles. Um, because I think, uh, I think he would have been a master. But Fields did have a role in a dramatic film. On loan to MGM, Fields appeared in the role of Mr. Micawber in the 1935 version of David Copperfield. MGM went all out with this all-star version of Dickens' novel. An avid fan of Charles Dickens, Fields leapt at the chance to appear in the film. Fields made for a memorable Micawber, the hard-pressed but ever-hopeful family man. Hounded by creditors, he nevertheless believes something will turn up. I have thwarted the malevolent machinations of our perilous enemies. In short, I have arrived. But for Fields, it was an isolated dramatic role, or rather, a comedic role in an isolated dramatic film. Having proven his box office worth in comedy shorts and supporting roles, Fields was rewarded with a lucrative contract at Paramount. He wrangled out of the studio a deal for $100,000 a movie in return for making three pictures a year for three years. Hi. What is this, an interview? Well, it is in a way, Mr. Fields. We'd like to know to what you attribute your great strength and trim figure. <laughs> That's rather embarrassing, but of course, uh... I'm a great voter of the outdoors. And uh, I play tennis, golf, boating, and uh, tennis. And of course, the flying trapeze. Really. <laughs> he starred in a number of comedy feature films, some of them remakes of his silent films. <laughs> Frequently, Fields contributed to the storyline or scripts, although under a pen name. Oh, that was wonderful. That was really nothing. Just one more question. Yes. What gives you such a magical eye? Oh, I don't know. I suppose hanging on the flying trapeze. Uh, do you mind if we see them? Oh, no, not at all. Help yourself. Help yourself. Oh, 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 oh. Nothing, really. <laughs> uh, what gives you girls this beautiful wind? <laughs> do you mind if I wouldn't get a big fit? <laughs> These films have become comedy classics. Their titles include Tilly and Gus, Six of a Kind with an all-star comedy cast, The Old Fashioned Way, one of his best, Mrs. Wiggs of the Cabbage Patch, co-starring with Zazu Pitts. It's a gift, the best he made for Paramount, and some think his all-time best film. Mississippi, in which Fields co-starred with crooner Bing Crosby. The Man on the Flying Trapeze, another favorite. Poppy, a remake of the Broadway hit and Sally of the Sawdust. W.C. Fields was now one of Hollywood's top stars, instantly recognizable to moviegoers everywhere. We're not signing any autograph books. You may sign off, folks, and uh, leave your phone number. Hey, Phil, that's Lancia's book. Maybe it's Lancia's girl's book. Bring them up to date, too. He was so famous, in fact, he began showing up in cartoons. What a beautiful hand you have, Miss Hartburn. After all, my friend is our Little chickadee, we're going to wander down the pathway of life together. We shall be like a calm field of asparagus. However, dependence on alcohol began to get the better of him. He frequently joked about his drinking, as in this footage of him refusing to imbibe milk. But his alcoholism was no joke. Even though he claimed he wasn't a drunkard on the set, he took time off from movie making to fight his addiction to the bottle and other health problems. 
During the hiatus, Fields ventured into the increasingly popular medium of radio. Stand by, please. He found it well suited to his sense of humor, even though sponsors and producers sat on the edge of their seats while the unpredictable and risk-taking Fields performed. Oh, last the other evening, as I was traversing my garden in search of flora and fauna, flora is my cook, you know, I see. <laughs> His most memorable encounters on radio were on the Edgar Bergen Charlie McCarthy show, where Fields and the ventriloquist, through his dummy, duped it out in a duel of insults. Yes, it's W.C. Fields, all right. Uh oh, can you see him? Well, I can just see a little of him, yeah? I can see him sticking his nose in the door. Sticking his nose in the door, he is. Oh, well, then it'll be five minutes before he gets here. Good evening, Mr. Fields. What did he say? I said... Good evening, that's all. Let's not jump at conclusions. <laughs> Charlie, I've been telling Mr. Fields that you want to apologize. Now, isn't that right? Uh, yes, it is. Yes, I do, Mr. Fields. I do. But I love them, little nippers. Yeah. Remember how we used to fight, Mr. Fields? Yeah. Foolish, wasn't it? Uh, remember the time I said I'd uh, slice you into a Venetian blind? Yeah. That was a good one. I think I don't know, was it? <laughs> remember how I topped you by saying that makes me shudder? <laughs> from a disgruntled termite. Why? Uh, please, please, gentlemen. I beg it on say Mr. Fields just doesn't love me anymore, that's all. Don't tell me I don't love you or I'll break every knot in your body. Please. Fields returned to the silver screen in the big broadcast of 1938. Rare behind-the-scenes footage captures Fields at work, or on location anyway. Well, Bill, how do you feel? Ah, uh, hello, Max. I feel like a June bride. Yeah, how's a June bride feel? I wonder, I wonder. <laughs> oh, I got such a wonderful day. Reminds me when I was a little kid, went on my first Sunday school picnic. Oh, so I remember that day, Bill. Yeah? Yeah, you got arrested, didn't you? Uh, yeah, I found, I found a watch that day. Yeah. Funny thing happened. Yeah, well, where'd you find it? Uh... I know, in the minister's pocket. Uh, got thrown in jail, too, didn't uh, let's get on the strip, man. Come on, I don't want to worry. You bring up the funny thing. The big broadcast of 1938 featured Fields' penchant for absurd humor. His co-star, Bob Hope, joked about a reward offered to anyone who could explain the plot of the film. Yet the movie proved a boon for Hope, who broke through to movie stardom. For Fields, it would be his last film for Paramount. When Paramount discarded him, Universal Studios snapped him up with a salary raise and the vague promise of more artistic freedom. Universal gave him $125,000 per film, plus $25,000 for the story of his first film for them, written under the pen name Charles Bogle, a name he had used on previous scripts. 
Field had been a top choice for the title role in The Wizard of Oz. But rumor has it that Fields haggled too much with MGM, demanding a large sum for his appearance, and so lost the role to character actor Frank Morgan. Other sources insist Fields turned down the role, being too engrossed in writing and starring in his first film for Universal, You Can't Cheat an Honest Man. The movie was tailor-made to capitalize on the radio rivalry of Fields and Charlie McCarthy, who, with Edgar Bergen naturally enough, were already making films for Universal. Fields played Larson E. Whipsnade, crooked circus manager. What? Uh, I got something. The film was followed by My Little Chickadee, with Fields teaming with the incomparable Mae West. What a man. Must come to see me sometime. Oh, yeah, yeah. I'll do that, My Little Chickadee. May I? So. Would you mind if I availed myself the second helping? Compromising me. It seemed a natural teaming, considering the drawling verbal fancy work of two such distinctive personalities. But no one at Universal pondered over why the two prima donna stars had never appeared together when they were both under contract at Paramount. With each writing their own scenes excluding the other, it seemed the two stars were in different movies, with relatively little screen time spent together. However, both were united in fighting the studio hacks and the Killjoy censors. Ah, Are you trying to show contempt for this court? No, I'm doing my best to hide. I'm the fan, are you? The film was a hit and is remembered as being better than it actually is. Do you have any last wish? Yeah, it's a right to see Paris before I die. Come on up here, we'll do. Many time we got nothing to do and lots of time to do it, by. Come on. Had they overcome their differences, they might have made an excellent team. There was talk of putting them together in another movie, but nothing came of it. Instead, Fields went on to make what many consider his finest film, The Bank Dick, rivaling It's a Gift among Fields fans. Ladies and gentlemen, today we honor a man who has been an inspiration to our citizens, a model to our youth, the eminent Egbert South. Today, today, uh, alias uh, W.C. Fields. We honor him for the fine example he has set as a husband and a father. And above all, for his heroism as a bank dick. Have come loaded? Should not. But I think you are. Writing under the pseudonym Mahatma Kane Jeeves, Fields concocted the story of a much beleaguered and henpecked family man who accidentally catches a bank robber. He is rewarded with the job of bank guard, a position for which he is extremely underqualified. In the course of the film, he convinces his future son-in-law to embezzle from the bank to invest in a beefsteak mine. Oh, what are you doing? This is I'm getting some of my money back. Give me that wheel. No! 
later, he gets taken hostage by a bank robber, resulting in one of the wildest car chases ever caught on film. Fields followed up the bank dick with Never Give a Sucker an Even Break, one of his most absurd cinematic excursions. Again biting the hand that fed him, Fields spoofed Hollywood, writing the plotless storyline under the moniker Otis Cribble Cobbless. The film mirrored the troubles Fields was having with Universal. The studio had their attention focused on the increasingly popular Abbott and Costello. All Fields got from Universal were complaints and criticism. In a short film shot at his home, Bill Fields took a swipe at Universal by making risque remarks about sweet and wholesome teen singing sensation Deanna Durbin, Universal's leading star and his next door neighbor. Now, Lord, this place was for it. Over through Deanna Durbin's window. He's taking a high seat at the time. Bill's increasing problems with the studio and the censors were compounded by health problems. His drinking was ravaging his body and ruining his career. Although he said that alcohol never affected his performance, he was offered fewer choice roles as his reliability came into question. Fields himself turned down parts when he felt he couldn't give 100%. Consequently, his film roles became smaller and less frequent. One of his last appearances was in Tales of Manhattan, but the sequence he was in was cut. The restored footage shows Fields had lost none of his magic. In deteriorating health, Fields was obliged to give up performing, one of his ailments being cirrhosis of the liver. You know, Thomas Mitchell with a very close friend tells about visiting W.C. Fields in the sanitarium just before he died. He found Fields doing something completely out of character. He was sitting there looking at a Bible, turning the pages. Mitchell asked him, uh, what are you doing, Bill? Fields looked up and said, uh, looking for loopholes. He died on Christmas Day, 1946, the holiday he most detested. Certainly a rare man, you know, comedy is so much harder to do than, than uh, non-comedy. I, I think it's, if you're an actor, you, you can do drama, melodrama, tragedy, straight, what we call. But I think it's very difficult to do comedy, and he, can do, he could do it all. Too bad a fellow like that, uh, I would have loved to have seen him in a, uh, in a solid non-comedic role. He's a fine actor. But one advantage of film is it can impart a kind of immortality. Always an anti-establishment figure, Fields and his acerbic humor found a resurgence in the turbulent 60s, with many a dorm room decorated with a poster of the dedicated misanthrope. New audiences continue to discover the rich vein of humor into which Fields had tapped. I'm gonna give her care. And action. His life was even the subject of a Hollywood movie, W.C. Fields and Me, starring Rod Steiger as Fields and Valerie Perrine as his mistress. Harold is drunk. Somebody put you in his orange juice. My pet peeve is Eleanor Roosevelt, the Internal Revenue Service, and all religious institutions. I was a uh, star when uh, Charles Chaplin was a chorus boy. As I recall, he was a uh, show dancer. <laughs> I just don't know whether to be your father or be your lover. I wouldn't turn you down on either. You're an alcoholic, Bill. 
You hurt not only yourself, but everybody around you. When I drink, I'm funny. Root beer is cheaper, but I don't get half the laughs. Before I go, let me leave you with a bit of fatherly advice. Yes? Never give a sucker an even brag. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Step right up and play the chickadee game. Chickadee, Grandpa? Yes, my dear. Just Still a star long after his office. death. Fields was often impersonated, but never equal. The tougher it gets. Ah, the last one is a doozy. Now, come up. I win. Drives me out of my bird. This is our favorite picture of W.C. Fields. It's the famous John Decker painting of Fields and Queen Victoria. It hangs in a well-known Hollywood restaurant. And once a year, Fields' friends gather beneath this painting and drink a toast to his memory. We go out and look the elk. W.C. Fields has become an iconic figure, a rascally rebel from Hollywood's golden era. Don't forget your moose card, Paul. Thank you, Paul. The great man lives on in his movies and in the appreciation of comedy fans everywhere.